Hey, this is week two of our parenting series. We've got a professional parent on this task right now. She deals with 200 kids a Sunday. What do you deal with, right? Come on now. Give it up for Pastor Marie Hermida. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Well, I usually ask that question to the kids, and I usually have to get them to say it like three or four times before I get the right answer that I think I need, but I'm not going to do that to you. I promised myself I would go from here, children's pastor, to like here, an adult. So uh, this is my attempt to be an adult for you guys. But um, no, tonight I'm really excited, and I I do want to preface this. I know that we have all uh, types of seasons and people in this room that are in different seasons of their life. And so I am a children's pastor, and I I have a, a variety of different people in the room every Sunday. I have to figure out how to speak to a six-year-old and a 12-year-old. So I, you know, I prayed about it tonight, and I said, you know what? I want to make sure that this is relevant for everybody in the room. So I prayed, and I, I hope that everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what season of life, whether you have adult kids, whether you have Um, no kids, and you're like, well, maybe someday, or uh, maybe you are in the thick of parenting right now. Uh, I really am praying, and I've prayed, and I put this message together to make sure that I speak to you as well. So um, let's start off. I'm very excited about this message, and a little bit about me is my name is Marie and Amita, and uh, my husband was the one with the guitar right here singing, and um, we love new life. We absolutely love new life, and our children love new life. I'm a mom of five. Actually, I'm a mom of six. We have one on the way. So, yeah, still can't. Ooh. But our, our uh, ages range from 21 all the way down to cooking in the oven. So we are literally, like I said earlier, we're in the thick of parenting of all ages. So, you know, uh, we have a, a lot of experience with parenting, but I always feel like I am not qualified. I don't know. Is there, are there any parents out there that say, oh, I am completely qualified for what I am doing right now? Anybody? Because I would love for you to maybe get up here and start speaking. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you know, parenting is, it's an adventure. That's, I, that's the best way of putting it. It's an adventure. And uh, there's nothing quite like parenting. Nothing quite like it. You know, there's nothing quite like holding your child for the first time. <sighs> uh, profound. A profound moment. And there's nothing quite like walking, waking up at one o'clock in the morning and your two-year-old's ready to play and ready to go. There's just nothing quite like parenting, you know? There's nothing quite like watching your child <sighs> using their gift to bless God and to bless others. My daughter um, was standing next to my husband today. That's my oldest daughter. And there's nothing like watching your child use their God-given gift. Nothing like it. And, uh, you know, there's also nothing quite like sitting on the couch at 3 a.m., praying and just hoping they're okay and just waiting for them to walk in the door. There's nothing quite like parenting. You know, there's nothing quite like that child running up to you, that two-year-old just like, mommy, mommy, nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And there's just so many seasons to parenting. And there's high seasons and there's low seasons, but it's all worth it. It's all worth it. You know, sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but it is all worth it. I know some of you, I'm looking at you and I'm like, you're in, you're in the thick of not sleeping and I can tell by your eyes. Um, but it's all worth it, I promise. And, you know, as your children's pastor here at New Life, I am so honored and full of joy to get to walk with you through the seasons, the highs and the lows of parenting, and to be able to build a firm foundation in your children's relationship with God. And through every season, through the hard seasons and through the easy seasons, through the fun seasons, through, through the not so fun seasons, I am so honored to be able to be a part of that. And, um, you know, quickly, I kind of want to go through some of the resources that we have here at New Life, because we want to equip you. And um, I know New Life has equipped me with a couple of things that has helped me in my parenting. And um, one of the things is you go on our app, 
it says resources right there. And um, you can go to kids or you can go to youth and uh, it gives you books. It gives you um, our, what is the, man, Right Now Media. Anybody using that? If you're not using that and you're a parent, you need to get that. It's Right Now Media and we give it free to you for free through the church. And um, it's a gift from us to you. And man, it is incredible. It is an incredible resource for every single age. It has Bible studies. It has parenting series, series on it. It also has stuff for your kids. My kids love Superbook. It's like going through the Bible with a little robot. Uh, I don't know. They love it. And they're getting the words, so it's awesome. But, you know, I do love Bluey. I do love Bluey. But I don't want them only to have Bluey, so we watch Superbook too. But, you know, the biggest thing that I, oh yeah, and then we have an app and this is really important. If you have a kid through zero to five, um, fifth grade, we have an app called ParentQ. And it's such an awesome resource for you to be able to know what your kid is learning. And to, it also gives you questions to ask your kid, little activities if you want, um, like blogs about how to interact with your kids con concerning the topic that we're talking about, like right now, and our older kids, we're talking about self-control. That's a good topic for kids, right? Tonight, they're talking about controlling your speech. Whew, it's a good one. So you probably want to know that and maybe talk to your kids. Hey, what did you learn about tonight? And then you already know and you have questions to ask them. And for the littles too, okay? Because one thing I do want you to know is that here at New Life, when you're in service, your kids are in service too. We don't provide childcare here. Okay, that's not a verbiage we use because we have services here at New Life. And you know, it's interesting to me, but when I became a children's pastor, I also did a little bit of, I studied psychology. And it was so interesting to me because it says all the psychologists, when you study the brain, children's brains develop, um, their connections are faster in the first five years than at any other time in their lives. And this is the time when the foundations for learning health and behavior throughout life are laid down. 90%, this is crazy to me, but 90% of a child's brain develops by the age of five. And the brain is most flexible and adaptable to learning during these earliest years. So when I became a children's pastor, I remember when I was a kid and you, know, you had the felt board and you had playtime and you had snack. But here, and I know other churches do too, but here we are super intentional to make sure that we have a service for your children from ages zero all the way up. We don't ever want to wait till they're in elementary school or till they're in youth to start telling them about God because in the Bible, we're about to see it's biblical to start your children when they're young. And it's also scientific. It makes the most sense to do it now. Now, before we get into what I'm about to talk about, I do want to say this. It's never too late. The grace of God is awesome because it covers a multitude of things, multitude of sins, multitude of issues. Maybe um, you're coming into this thing and you're like, I'm a, I feel like I'm a little late. You're talking about the first five years and my kid's 15. Well, God's grace is sufficient and it's never too late. Even with an adult kids, it's never too late. God's good like that. He understands and he meets us where we're at. So as I'm talking today, I just want you to know, I'm not just talking about five-year-olds. I'm not talking about second graders. I'm talking about a wide variety of children. We're all children, right? We're all God's children. And so tonight, I, um, I have 52 points. No, I'm, I'm not just kidding. I only have two, okay? Because I know I preach to kids and I can't do too many points because they'll be gone after the second one. So I only have two tonight. Okay, and um, I do really want to do dive into the Bible because I, I man, the Word of God is so important. It's such a resource, and it says it really does say a lot about parenting. The Bible really does. If you dive into it and you have the perspective of a parent, then when you read this, you're like, man, this is so good. I need to know this. I needed to hear that today. And so today we're going to talk about two topics, two resources, two parts of the Bible that I think are just such gold for people in general and for parents. 
So we're going to talk about one, dedicate, and two, set the standard. So one, dedicate, and two, we're going to set the standard. So let's talk about dedicate. Uh, our text is Proverbs 22, verse 6. And I think a lot of people have heard this text before. It's very, um, I don't know, like when you have a, a dedication and stuff like that, this verse is tossed out there all the time. But it really is an incredible verse. So if uh, you want to write that down, um, but Proverbs 22, 6, it says this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old... He will not depart from it. Now, I really want to break this verse down. I hope that you love to um, nerd out on the Bible because I love to go and dive into like the Hebrew definition and the words that God like actually used when the you know He wrote the Bible. That he had men write the Bible for Him and all these things. And this is such an interesting thing to me because this verse seems very cut and dry but actually there's so much meaning behind it. See, the Hebrew verb, it's a verb, commonly translated as train up, in Proverbs 22 is chanak. And I was like, sorry, excuse me, chanak, all right? It's a Hebrew word, it's chanak, and chanak means this. It means to train, to dedicate, or inaugurate, which that means introduce to. When you're inaugurating someone, you're introducing them into what they're about to do, the president, that kind of thing. So that's what this word means. And it's used five times in the Bible. And it's interesting because in Deuteronomy, it's used twice. And um, it refers to the dedication of a newly built home or house. And then it also is used in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And in this one, it refers to the dedication of the Lord's house, the temple. So Solomon, when the temple was built, before the Lord's presence came there, he chanaked, he, he sacrificed thousands, and th he, he gave God thousands of sacrifices. There was so many things that he did to dedicate the temple before the Lord dwelled in that place. The Jewish festival of Hanukkah, which celebrates the cleansing and rededication of the Lord's house, is formed from this word. They chanaked the temple. Or in Deuteronomy, they chanaked their house. Before even soldiers would go out on the battlefield, if they had a new home, they had to do this. It was a serious thing for them. So in the five occurrences of this verb, in four of them, the object that is chanaked is either an Israelite home or Yahweh's home or God's home. So a dwelling is dedicated, it's set aside, it's claimed, it's owned, it's inhabited, uh, inhabited, bleh, inhabited by someone. So to Hanaka house is to say, this place belongs to so-and-so. It's his and no one else's. Let no one else attempt to claim it. This is the way things stand. With that background in mind, let's take another look at Proverbs 22, verse 6. When the Hebrew, and also the second part of it, when uh, the phrase that is tra it's translated, in the way he should go, it literally means according to his way. According to the child's way. With that in mind, let's read this verse again. Dedicate a child according to his way. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I know this, this verse, it seems like it's giving us a promise that our kids will never make wrong decisions. That's not reality. How many of you know that that's not reality? Every day you live that out. You're like, man, I'm training them up and they're still making wrong decisions. <laughs> You know, or maybe some of us, we have older kids that maybe are not following in the way that they were raised up in. But what it is saying is it's, it's a verb. It's showing what our first actions as parents must be. You know, in the NIV version, it says, start children off. 
on the way that they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. From the beginning, our job as parents is to dedicate and then inaugurate or introduce our children to the things of the Lord. And what a task. What a task. What an honor, first of all, but what a task. And the definition of dedicate, if we get even deeper into it, is devote, devotion. We devote our time, our money, ourselves to a particular task or purpose. So when our children are given to us, our declaration should be this. Remember, we talked about what the definition of chanak is for a home. This is what chanak is for our children. This child belongs to God. They are his and no one else's. Nothing and no one can attempt to claim this child. This is the way things stand. It's, it's, it's a little different when you look at it that way. It's not about the kids' decisions and their future. It's about what we're supposed to do right now. And like I said, this is, it's not too late. It's not too late. You can do this right now and you can begin to pray over your kids. God, I know that my kid is yours. My child is yours. They are yours and no one else's and nothing else can attempt to claim my child. And this is the way things stand. We need to hanak our children. It's that, it, goes, it goes deeper and deeper, but that's, that's the basic concept of that verse. So I have a question before we move to the next one. What are you devoted to? In your home, your kids see what you're devoted to. They see what you're committed to. And so in your mind, I just want you to think, you know, what does it, when your kids look at you, what do they see that you're devoted to? And then what are you devoting them to? Think about this. Because I see a lot of effort into a lot of things that probably won't matter in the future. But I will tell you this, any moment that you can put the word of God into your kid, that's going to be the best thing that ever, and it will, it will have repercussions that will last for eternity. And I'm not saying that other things are bad. I think sports are great. They build character. I'm not saying things are bad. I, I, friends are great. They're awesome as long as they have the right ones, right? But what, do you, what is your true devotion to? And what are you dedicating your kids to right now? Is it to the word of God? To studying the word of God? Because if we can go, if we go into depth, I, it is crazy. The Hebrews had it right. They had it right. The, the, their boys from the ages of five to 12, they had to study the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Not only did they have to study it, they memorized it before they could be a man or part of the community. So like in the community, it not this, they knew what was important. They knew the standard which God had set for his people because their parents were like, no, before you do anything else, before you do, you go and be a man, before you go and do, by 12, they had memorized the entire Torah. That's, that's incredible. They had it right. They had dedicated their children to something. So I'm just asking, I'm just I want to start the wheels turning. What are you dedicating your children to? What are you dedicated to? What does your life reflect that you're dedicated to? You know, in our home, I'll just tell you this. You parents, you set the tone of your home. You do. You're supposed to, at least. But that's biblical. You set the tone. And in our house, I'm just going to give you an example. We emphasize the importance of church. And let me explain why. I know we're pastors, but let me explain why. This has been my whole life. This is what my parents did with me too. Because it's a place where our kids can come and practice the things that they hear during the week in our home. So 
It's not that we're bringing our kids to the church to be taught and to raise them up. We're doing that. It's a place where they can come and have affirmation, be around other people who are like-minded and also put into practice the things that they're learning at home. And so for our little kids, we emphasize learning the word of God. I will say this, if you're a parent in the room and you have a kid in the studio, we every single week, it's very important to them. It's also very important just in general for them to bring their Bibles because every single time they walk into that studio, we dig into the word of God and it's called navigate the word. And we go through it every single time. And so the kids that bring their Bible, they get a little prize, but most importantly, they're learning how to navigate the word of God. So we have a time before, and it takes a while, but that's okay. Because isn't that the most important thing that they know before they go to youth, that they know um, that there's 66 books of the Bible. It's, dis- it's split into two, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the story of why we need a savior and the New Testament shows us the savior. And it's split into books and the chapters are the big numbers and the verses are the small numbers. We learn that. And then we put it into practice and they find it in their Bible. And so if you have a kid in the studio, I understand you're like, they aren't gonna understand. No, but they can at least start learning how to navigate. And so if they bring a real Bible, you know, we do this for the forest room and it's okay if they don't bring a real Bible because they can't read, but um, they do get a prize, by the way. So some of you, um, I know it's hard to keep track of the little Bibles, but man, it's a big deal for them. <laughs> it's a really big deal. Um, and it's, it's developing a habit too, because we should all be bringing our Bibles to church. Um, isn't that the reason that we come, you know? Uh, to, to get into the word of God. So I think it's important for our kids to first of all, learn how to use the Bible. But anyway, so learning the word of God, I digress. And with our older kids, we emphasize serving. So Saturday night, we get their clothes ready. We lay them out, not, not our older kids. <laughs> we let them choose their clothes. Um, <laughs> but we lay our little kids clothes out And then we bathe them early and we put them down a little bit earlier because we don't want them to be trashed. We want them to be ready for the word of God. We want them to be ready for church. And I'm telling you, our kids love church. They do, they really do. And you know, in the morning we make them up, we wake them up and we're very specific with our verbiage. We say, hey guys, wake up, it's church day. And they're like, ugh. I'm not joking. This is how my kids are when we say it's church day. And I'm talking about my younger kids, right? Okay, my older kids, they wake themselves up. <laughs> but, and then we say, we get to go to church today. Our kids love church and they're so upset when they don't get to come. So upset. And I'm not, I'm not being facetious, like I'm serious. My seven-year-old gets really mad at me when she can't come to church. And so I'm just telling you, it's all about how we set the tone. What we put is important. Well, you know, I mean, do you set your kid's jersey and make sure that it's all ready and to go for the next day? I think you do, unless you are one of those parents, which is, I mean, I've been there too, where you're like looking for the thing, the shoe, and it's like you're five minutes late out the door, all that. But honestly, like we prepare for what we really, what we really see that matters. You know what I'm saying? So we're intentional. And, and, and with our older kids, like I said, we emphasize serving because we're trying to teach them that they can be contributors and not just consumers. And that should be what we're trying to teach our older kids in general for life, that they're contributors to society and they're not just consumers. That's what she, we, the goal is to raise up children, raise up adults that are contributors to the world around them, to their families, contributors and not just consumers, contributors to society, to their community and to their church and not just consumers. So are you setting that example? Are you just a consumer? Now I'm not trying to, please hear my heart. I'm, I'm just telling you, you set the tone. Are you someone who is willing to contribute? 
or are you only a consumer? Because that's what your, kill, your, your children are going to become. It's so important. And so that's why we emphasize serving with our older children. It's not because, well, we're short, so <laughs> Janessa, come back to the studio. No, we're, we're, we're trying to get our kids and our, our younger kids, they're going to get there someday. But right now, our older kids, while they're still in our home, we say, you're going to come to church and you're going to sit one and you're going to serve one. And because, like I said, we want them to be well-rounded as adults to be contributors and not just consumers. And church is a perfect way to start setting that precedent. So, you know, I don't know. That's just how, what we do in our house. And so I encourage you, start thinking about it. What are you dedicating your children to? What are you dedicating your time to? What are you dedicating your money to? What are you dedicating yourselves to? It's important to think about it. And, you know, as we look at the Bible, God is a great example of the perfect parent, which we will never be, but he is the perfect example that we should always look to. And I, I know this is crazy, but um, when, I, when Pastor Todd asked me to do this message, I was like, okay. And I knew that I was gonna talk about Proverbs, right? Because that's the typical child verse that you talk about with parenting. But then I started reading in Deuteronomy. No. And oh my goodness, that book is a great example of parenting. Let me explain. See, Israel was a very young nation. They had just come out of Egypt and they knew nothing. They had never been a nation. They had only been slaves. They had no idea what to do, no idea where to go. They just knew that there was somewhere they were supposed to go because God told them that. And so it's such a cool example because we see that the first thing that God do, does when he brings Israel out of Egypt is he leads them to a mountain and he sets the standard. It's the first thing he does with his nation, with the baby nation of Israel, is he sets the standard for his people. You know, he made it obvious. He made it obvious who was leading. He showed himself as a pillar of fire in the night and a pillar of cloud in the day. And so that the young nation of Israel had clear and obvious direction. They didn't have to wonder, where are we going today? What are we doing? I don't know. Nope. There's the fire, we're following it. There's the pillar, we're following it. If it's moving, we're moving. If it's staying, we're staying. And that is a good father. That's a good father. Our young children should know that they follow you and not the other way around. And it's hard. It's very hard to do that. But it's important because that's the standard that God set, right? And, and he's not doing it as a dictator. If you think about it, he's not doing it as a dictator. He was doing it out of love because he knew that they knew nothing about being a nation. They knew nothing about conquering. They knew nothing. And he knew that if he just left them to themselves, that they were gonna just go right back. They said it. They're like, why don't we just go back to Egypt? We had food there. Like, let's just go back there. That, why would we come out to this? No, God said this. And he's like, no. No, I'm taking you to the land that's gonna be fulfill, fulfill your every need. I'm taking you somewhere. So pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, obvious direction. And it's so important for our children to have obvious direction. I, I was at a conference. My husband and I went to a conference the other day and Christine Kane was there and she gave an incredible analogy, and I'm going to use it tonight for parenting. She didn't do it for parenting, but I'm going to use it for parenting. She lived in Australia when she was growing up. If you know who she is, she's a, a woman speaker, and she has the Australian accent, and she was, so she was talking to us, and she was telling us about standards, and she said, my father, when we would go to the ocean, he would say, okay, he would bring two massive umbrellas. He would put one over here on this side of the beach and one over here on this side of the beach. And he'd look at us and he'd say, okay, you see that? You see that one right there? You see that, that uh, umbrella and that one over there? As long as you can see them and you're in between them, you'll be safe and I can see you. 
and you'll be okay. These are the boundaries. And was he doing that to be mean? Was he doing that to be a dictator? To be like, well, you can only go out this far and you can only do, no, he was like, I am setting a standard. Here's the boundaries. Now go have fun. But remember, always look to make sure that you're in the boundaries. And that, that is what we as parents must do. We have to set the standard in our home. And maybe you're like, okay, what, what is the standard? Like, what am I supposed, I'm glad you asked. Because Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 36, I think I, yes. First of all, a guy was coming to Jesus and trying to trap him um, because he was asking him about the law. And so this guy says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And you know, it's funny because I think a lot, at least I did, I thought, Jesus, wow, that was really creative. You made that up. No, no. Remember, when they were little, they had to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Jesus actually references Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and he, that says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus is referencing the word. He's, he's going back to what he learned as a child. But I want you to write this down because we don't have time to go through the whole thing. I want you to read Deuteronomy chapter five and six. This is such a great example of standards that we have to have in our home. And you know, at this, in chapter six, Moses brings all the people in and they're getting ready to go into that land, the land that God had promised them. And he'd led them and he'd, he'd, declared, he'd given them the law. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go claim this land and I want you to conquer it and I'm gonna go before you and I'll do it for you. He was laying it all out for them. And Moses says this, hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And this is where you get the parenting advice right here. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So what decrees and what commandments is God talking about there? Does anybody know? Because if you go back to chapter five, God had just laid it all out for them. It's the 10 commandments. That's that's the standard. That's the standard that God set for his children. And that's the standard that we should set for our children. And and my question, and, and this is not to be condemning, but do you know the Ten Commandments? Could you, could you tell me the Ten Commandments right now? Because here's the thing. I know when I grew up, every school I walked into, the Ten Commandments were hanging. Every courthouse we walked into, police departments, all these places, the Ten Commandments were hanging. And so I knew them growing up just, well, my parents made me memorize them, but also because they were everywhere. Do we see them anymore? No. Now, there is one state that is starting to put them back into the schools, which is great, because here's the thing. When we set the standard in front of our children, they know it, and they can follow it. There's boundaries, but if we remove those standards, there's no boundaries. There's no, how do you know your identity? How do you know what you're supposed to do? How are they supposed to know not to murder? How are they supposed to know? They're kids. They don't know anything, but if we set the standard in front of them and say, here's the deal, here's 
As long as you stay in these boundaries, you're safe. As long as you stay in these, you'll be blessed. That's what Jesus said to his people. And so I'm gonna read through the 10 commandments real quick and then we'll be done. The first commandment is this, you shall have no other gods before me. Think about this in your life. I just want us to think about whether our home is following these standards. Because when I read it the other day, I was like, hmm, I'm gonna have to change some things in my life. Which is great, because that's what the word of God, that's what the law is supposed to do. And it's supposed to point us to Jesus for before I keep going, because Jesus, there's no way we can live up to these standards I'm about to read to you. And the beauty of it is, is that Jesus came to fulfill the law. So this points us to the need of a savior. But anyway, that's a whole other message. You shall have no other gods before me. That's one. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven and above and on earth below. um, And you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's a really good one. Number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Number four, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Number five, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land your God is giving you. Now, these first five, let's go back to what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The first five ties in to that statement right there. Standard number one. Now let's keep reading. Number six, you shall not murder. You shall, number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Don't lie. Number 10, you shall not covet. You shall not desire what your neighbor has. The last five commandments fall under the second standard that Jesus gave. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two standards. These are what we say, okay, kids, You're gonna go out into this world, but you know what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And as long as you're you're seeing these standards, as long as you're striving to meet these standards, as long as you can know that you're gonna live a good life, that you're gonna have peace, you're gonna have, you're gonna be successful, not maybe not in the world standards, but you're gonna be successful in what God has called you to be and what God has created you to be. These are the standards for our children. This is where our nation is falling right now. We have no standards for our kids. And it starts in the home. It does not start in the school. It does not start in the church. It starts in the home. And it's the parent's job to set the standard. It's the parent's job to dedicate, to chanak. It takes sacrifice to do that. It's hard. It's not always easy to be devoted and to make sure our kids are seeing that we are devoted and devoting them to learning the word of God. And then we have to set the standard. Where do we begin? Where do we begin? We begin with these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I know, like I said earlier, maybe some of you, I read those 10 commandments and you're like, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, not doing that. I haven't been doing that. What do I, I mean, my kids hear me say these words all the time. My, my kids see me put this in front of church all the time. What, see, here's the thing about the law. It's there to, to let us know that we need a savior. 
And so our job is to always tell the kids we have a standard, but you know what? We can hold our kids to that standard, but guess what? They're not gonna meet it. (laughs) They're not gonna meet it. And so God, as a parent to us, he comes, he comes to us with consequences and with grace. And that is where we need to meet our children. Our children need to know that there's standards. And if, they're, if they don't meet the standard, which they won't, guys, they won't. We have to meet them like God does with us. He loves us. Now, there are consequences to our decisions, good and bad. We, we lift our kids up. We praise them when they do the right thing. That should be our first goal is to look at our kids and say, what have they done right today? And we encourage them and we build them up. But when they don't meet that standard, we say, you know what? Was that, did you, did that follow the standard of loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? No. Did you love your neighbor as yourself? No. But you know what? It's okay. Okay. We're going to do better next time. And there is going to be a consequence. Now you have to go and apologize. or or now, But there's grace under Jesus. There's always a standard. There's all, we never remove the standard. That's not what grace does. Grace does not remove a standard. It propels us toward a Savior who helps us desire to follow that standard. And a Holy Spirit who is our counselor and leads us and guides us. It's okay to say, you know what? I messed up. I made a mistake. You should do that in front of your kids, by the way. Shouldn't have said that. I am so sorry. We set the standard. We set the tone in our home. Let's pray. God, I pray right now for every single person in this room, Lord, There was a lot of information that was just laid out, but as we walk away, God, I pray that we would choose to dedicate not just our children, but our lives to you. Lord, that we would have a desire to introduce our house, our home to you. That we would set the standard in our own life, God, and be the example to the world around us and to our children. And that we would always look to you, Jesus, as our Savior and the one who gives us grace. Lord, I pray for the person in this room who feels inadequate. like they're not doing a good job, like they're not enough. Lord, I pray right now that you would lift them up, lift their head up as their heavenly father and let them know that you love them, God. And there's grace and there's no other time but now to dedicate and to set the standard. We love you, God. Thank you so much for bringing us here tonight. And all God's people said, amen. Sorry, I do that with the kids. Um, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Um, Tap into those resources that I talked about earlier and just know that God gives you grace. Give your kids grace. You guys can do this. You guys can do it.